Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the lecture 254 and Squint and Pediatric Ophthalmology session 41. And we have none other than Professor Pradeep Sharma, sir, with us, who has been through all the sessions with us diligently and been there for us. And the last word has to be by him, the showstopper, Pearls and Strabismus in Pursue of Stereopsis. I request Shafali, who has been there as the host for all the sessions of Squint, to please go ahead and introduce Pradeep, sir. Thank you, Rolika. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce the master himself for this masterclass today, Professor Pradeep Sharma, sir, from Center for Sight, New Delhi. Uh, sir has done his MBBS and MD from All India Institute of Medical Sciences, and he's a fellow of National Academy of Medical Sciences 2007. He did his fellowship for advanced training in strabismus in USA at Jules Stein Eye Institute, UCLA, Wills Eye uh, Hospital, Philadelphia, and Richmond. And he was awarded by the International Strabismological Society Association 2001. He is the first Asian invited to deliver the NAP lecture by American Association for Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus at Vancouver 2016. Achievement Award by American Academy of Ophthalmology 2017, Colonel Rangachari Gold Medal, the best from the AIOS for the best scientific paper 1984, and Dr. Athalwe Award 2002 from uh, AIOS, and awarded Dr. Baldev Singh Oration at, of NAMS, that is National Academy of Medical Sciences, and named orations of 12 state ophthalmological societies, and I focus HK Tewari Gold Apple 2019. Sir is a visiting faculty in Orbis, international member, uh, American Association for Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus, and International Strabismological Association member, Communications Committee, International Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus Council. So is the chairman, Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus, AIOS Collegium for FICO, vice president of Thalmic Research Association, RPC Ames in the past, former president Sposi, uh, and he has over 250 scientific articles in national and international journals or chapters in books and uh, has authored Strabismus uh, Simplified and Essentials of Ophthalmology. An absolute honor and pleasure to have him today and uh, to have him as the pan have had him as a panelist for the entire Strabismus session. Welcome, sir, and over to you for tonight. Thank you, Shefali. It's been a pleasure all through. And I think it's a real pleasure to see so, uh, the people in loving strabismus and that was one thing that I always been interested in uh, doing. The last word in strabismus is stereopsis and the journey of any ophthalmologist or even uh, anybody in strabismus is the pursuit of stereopsis. So we'll be talking about that as our goal. Uh, as we know strabismus surgery, it is also giving us cosmesis. It definitely improves your personality it corrects the diplopia, but majorly it gives you back your binocular vision and stereopsis. So stereopsis is the new goal post. It's not just 2020 vision or six by three vision with good near vision J1 that the ophthalmologists have to strive for, but to get back the good stereopsis and good fusion, which God has granted us. So we are not just going to treat strabismus, but we'll be restoring binocular vision and stereopsis. What is stereopsis? It is the ability of each eye to see the things little differently. And those disparities are within the panem's area of fusion and they can be fused. And this effort of fusion by our brain gives us the true or the real 3D effect. Otherwise we may be having monocular clues to give us uh, some 3D effect, but this is the real 3D effect, which can only come with both the eyes functioning normally. Uh, we can assess this stereopsis by these charts like red dot with Polaroid glasses or the TNO test with red and green glasses for near. And for distance, you have specialized tests like the Frisbee Davis distance FD2 test, uh, which we do at times in specialized areas. But I think something which you have to remember is a simple bedside test, which works well to demonstrate gross stereopsis. Now this simple test, as you can see here, a child is holding a pencil and I'm holding a pencil. The child is supposed to touch the tip of the pencil, which is in my hand. And this is only possible if uh, one sees with both the eyes open. If one eye is covered, even with good vision uh, in that eye, you will not be able to do. So this is not possible to do monoclearly. So it's a very good test, which tells us about gross stereopsis. 
So this is a very simple test, which you should always keep it uh, with you. Whenever you are in doubt, whether a child has a manifest uh, squint or any problem in vision, even which is gross, it can be not possible to do this test, pass this test. This is a case story, which I usually like to talk about, which emphasizes the point that how we can actually have stereopsis and that is by getting back the early alignment. This child was born to the illustrious pediatric ophthalmologist from US, Dr. Kenneth Wright. And at birth, he was having straight eyes and the father noticed that he's turning in at three months age. At six months, he gave the proper fully cycloplege required refraction. And still, if you see the Bruckner's reflex in the left eye shows you a more bright reflex, indicating that there is a residual esotropia in spite of his full correction. So at six months of age, this child, lucky child was operated and his eyes were straightened, and he happens to develop stereopsis normally. Uh, that's Dr. Ken Wright uh, smiling, and he has the reason to smile for each one of the other children all over the planet. Critical periods to which we need to remember for treatment is the cricket's rule of fours and sixes, which we shouldn't miss. Four to six weeks, we talk about congenital cataract to be corrected. Similarly, four to six months is a period when infantile esotropia should be observed and definitely tackled by the first year. Four to six years for intermittent exotropia and stagmas or refractive error or any pathology in the childhood should be resurrected or corrected in time. Timing is everything. And this is true not only for children, but even in adults, if we have a manifest abysmus lasting for more than a year, we will be losing part of our binocular vision. A child may have a constant squint at the uh, infancy and if he is restored, irrespective of an ESO or EXO. Now here there is an exotropia and if it's a manifest exotropia, that also needs to be corrected. So we can restore the alignment and it has to be done early. Does spot diagnosis and spot management work in strabismus? No. We have to follow the principle of the, uh, what I call as the five-pronged approach. The O-C-I-P-E, observation, confirmation, inference, planning, and finally, execution. Observe, confirm, infer, plan, and execute, and then you can restore the binocular vision. What are the perils? There could be an improper diagnosis in the form of a pseudostrabismus. The upper picture shows you a child who has an appearance of a convergent squint, esotropia, because of a telecanthus, so it is a wide nasal bridge and having an epicanthic folds, which are covering the nasal part of the conjunctiva. And this gives you an appearance of an esotropia and which becomes definitely more impressive when he looks on the sides. And most of us will definitely think that the child definitely has an esotropia or even an inferior oblique overaction in the right eye because of the coverage of the cornea by the epicanthic fold. Similarly, another picture in the middle shows you a girl having a esotropia. Now, this is again because of the fact there is a ureblepharon, large palpebral apertures. The eyes are more in the nasal part and they appear to be having an esotropia. There could be a similarly a pseudo exotropia, look of a child having an exotropia, which on cover test will not be correct. So, this could also be because of a regressed ROP at times. Now, this a patient came to me recently and if you see, I thought there was an easy trophy out. When I covered the right eye, the left eye didn't move. You see that? It's still appearing isotropic. Although he has 6-6 six, six vision and the eye doesn't move, so it is a pseudo-ET. I was a little surprised myself because there was not much of refractive error. On more questioning, I found out he was a high myo, post-LASIK, and because of the negative kappa angle, the left eye was appearing to be an isotropic eye. So here you have to be careful when you do these uh, cases. Now look at this child who was initially looking like a isotropic. If you cover the eye and the other eye which is now open is not moving, it means that the eye is already looking at you. But on the bottom picture, if you see, the eye is moving, the right eye being covered, the left eye moves out, a cover test is a very sure, short way of knowing there is a true isotropia or exotropia uh, compared from a 
apparent squint so that is a simple thing which you have to keep handy with you when we have a child having an eso or exotropia the second step would be to do a proper cycloplegic refraction an age appropriate cycloplegic refraction is what we talk about so up till 5 years of age in indian uh, subcontinent we usually say that atropine ointment 1% should be used for uh, cycloplegia and the older children can be done with the home atropine eye drops which is a safer thing than cyclopentolate and once we have done the proper cycloplegic refraction and given the proper glasses uh, many of these squints which are having an accommodative isotropia could be fully corrected as you see in this picture but some may have a partially accommodative isotropia what we mean here is that if you give full correction as you can see in this girl and she is wearing a full correction looking at distance but if you look carefully the left eye is still isotropic now this would mean that this is a partially accommodative isotropia uh, remember we have to look at distance fixation with an accommodating control target for distance fixation in order to know there is a non accommodative component don't misjudge by a near uh, examination or near fixation which may be because of a convergence excess isotropia for an accommodative target and this is because of a high ac by ratio requiring only bifocals and not a surgery for the as a, for a non accommodative component so here this is a pearl accommodative target with proper prescription you have to assess whether the person is fully corrected or he has a residual isotropia so what the take home is here that if you give full correction if the eyes are uh, straight both for distance and near this is a fully accommodative isotropia whereas if there is a residual eso which only shows up on distance uh, with uh, then it is a non accommodative component along with a fully accommodative so it's a partially accommodative isotropia but if you only see it on near and this is with a accommodative target you would have to give bifocals a child having an uncorrected hypermetropic refractive error can have different behaviors if he is a very aggressive child type a personality as we say he would be trying to accommodate to see clear and if he is not given his glasses to uh, correct for the uh, refractive error he would end up having an isotropia and subsequently have an isotropic uh, strabismic amblyopia on the other hand if he is a lazy kind happy go lucky child he would not accommodate he would in that case have both the eyes having blurred images and that will lead to a bilateral amyotropic amblyopia so this algorithm which is given from uh, von nuden's book is basically indicating that different children may behave for the same sort of uncorrected refractive error differently so when we have the uh, isotropia or exotropia we are going to measure it and what we suggest is always use prism cover test that means you use the prisms for neutralization and not a hirschberg's reflex which is only to be used if in a very small child you cannot manage to do the prism bar testing when we use prisms we have to be careful about the faulty techniques uh, if you stack prisms one over the other they would create a different power do not stack prisms remember 2 plus 2 is 5 not 4 do or do panch as the hindi movie exemplifies so you have to split the prism between the two eyes in order to measure if they are more than the amount that you can give with on uh, one set if you have a child or a, a person having a high refractive error now remember these glasses which are high refractive errors will also have induced prismatic effect and they become really significant for more than 20 prism diopters or more than plus or minus 5 diopter power so in these situations you will have to use correcting uh, tables which are there in the books you can take up from there or you can have a formula to calculate it now here look at this child he is having measured exotropia of 70 prism diopters the left eye you see it's 70 prism diopters through the glasses but the power he is wearing is minus 15 diopters so i just look at the table and i find for minus 15 with 70 prism diopters the corrected value for uh, targeting of a surgery would actually be 51 prism diopters so a difference of almost 20 prism diopters which could induce errors if you are not careful induced prismatic effect even in normal people can give rise to a faulty assessment of a squint like this girl who is wearing decentered glasses 
appears to have a squint on cover test, but the moment we look for the glasses and center her glasses correctly, as you see on the right side picture, the eyes become straight. So there can be an induced prismatic effect, which you have to be careful. When you have a person having a poor vision in one eye, very poor vision, he may have a sensory strabismus, a sensory eso or a sensory exotropia. Now, if you use prisms over the squinting eye, you will not be able to judge the movement of the uh, deviating eye. So it is preferred to use the prism over the good eye. This is known as a reverse Krimsky test. And like in this girl you see here, the right eye, we have put the prism of 45 prism diopters and the left eye has got centered, which was otherwise having poor vision. So this is the recommended way of testing the squints. If you have a problem of squint, uh, we know why it is uh, more mischief uh, for most of us because there are 12 extraocular muscles in nine houses or nine gazes. Uh, just remember, like in the zodiac signs, we have 12 houses and nine planets which do the mischief. Here it's a little variation of numbers, nine houses, 12 extraocular muscles which can create the mischief. What you need to do is look at these nine houses, the primary position, the supraversion, the infraversion, up and down. Then the levo version on the left gaze, the dextro version on the right gaze, dextro elevation, dextro depression, levo elevation, levo depression. So these nine tertiary positions you have to be careful about and look for the deviations. Now the horizontal eso or exo could be there, vertical hyper or hypotropia could be there. And similarly, a torsional deviation could be there, which could not be seen in this nine houses, but you will have to then look into the uh, cyclo version for, by looking at the fundus or other tests. Now, this is what we talk about. If you peep into the fundus, normally the fovea lies in front of the disc. The line, horizontal lines uh, passing through the lower pole of the disc should be the lower limit of the fovea and the upper limit being the uh, junction of the upper two-third and one-third of the disc. So that is the normal position. On the left-hand picture, you see an extortion, which is there. Uh, mind you, extortion is with S and not T. Uh, the, otherwise, that would be extortion of money, but we are talking of the uh, cycloversion or extortion. And similarly, you can have an intorsion when the fovea is placed above the line joining the upper two-third and lower one-third. So this is an objective way of looking at the torsion. Uh, this is a person having an extortion on the because of the inferior oblique overaction, and after the surgery, this has been corrected. So the bot right lower picture is showing you what is the normal picture of a person having a correct positioning of the fovea. On the indirect ophthalmoscopy also, you can see the torsion objectively, or even in the fundus photography, you can actually measure the torsion. Uh, a blind spot charting with the uh, uh, head positioned straight also can be documenting uh, extortion. Like in this case, a 15 degrees of extortion is being shown by the blind spot being not bisected by the horizontal line, two-third, one-third, but much below. So this is a 15 degrees of extortion. Subjectively, we can measure the torsion with the help of diplopia charting, Lancaster red-green charts, double medox rod, the Bogolny glasses, if you have loose glasses on right and left side, the synoptophore with after image, Polaroid stereo projector, or the double medox rod as shown here on the uh, right-hand picture. And you can neutralize the torsion which is seen by the person and you can see how much is the actual torsion. How do we manage these squints? We can do non-surgical management, partly we have talked about proper refraction and proper prescription. Amblyopia therapy, if there is any associated amblyopia because of the squint or the refractive error. Orthoptic exercises for a, a small angle squints or the intermittent exotropias. Prism neutralization again, which may be for the residual squints or small angle squints, and then the surgical by doing a proper strabismus surgery. Use of prisms, like in this child, you can see here, he has a 20 prism diopters in which 10, 10 of Fresnel prisms has been given on the right and the left eye, and he has been neutralized for his deviation, and the eyes are now in alignment. Uh, so this is a non-surgical way of correcting small angle squints. If you have an amblyopia, of course, occlusion is the sheet anchor, which can be used to treat the amblyopia. Uh, so this is important to remember that occlusion, there is a concept of occlusion hours. 
So even though we may use part-time occlusion for the sake of convenience and the compliance of the child, uh, it does prolong the duration of uh, treatment. It is known that it is the occlusion hours. It is one logmar uh, visual equity improvement equivalent to about 120 occlusion hours. So if you are doing a full-time occlusion, the waking time, of course, being calculated, not the 24 hours, will be uh, prolonged by a part-time occlusion, which may be six hours or uh, two hours per day. Nowadays, we are talking of active vision exercises in the form of monocular video games to facilitate the MLAPA therapy in addition to the occlusion. And this has found to uh, accelerate or improve the chances of MLAPA therapy. On the other hand, there are options like binocular vision stimulation, which is a new paradigm to treat amblyopia. Here, the binocular video games exercises are given uh, in such a way that the amblyopic eye is given a higher contrast and the normal eye is given poorer contrast to balance. And uh, here we are moving from iPads, the occlusion patches to iPads or technology giving us this. Uh, dicoptic custom made action video games are also possible to be treating amblyopia in older individuals, adult amblyopia also, as shown by studies. Remember, vision is like a language. You can learn a difficult language even in older age. So if you're not born in China and you're transferred to China, you can still learn Chinese, but it will be much more difficult uh, compared to if you had been born in China itself. So the same is true for vision and amblyopia. So if you have an amblyopia, you can treat it older than five or six years also, but it will be as much more difficult. And we should strive to treat amblyopia in the early age when the neuroplasticity is there. Binocular stimulation has been there right from the times of synoptophore, the chiroscopes or the stereoscopes. Uh, we have been using home exercises with stereograms even in the past uh, 50 or 100 years back. Uh, similarly, Remy separators were there. But now with the help of the red and green goggles and the polaroid glasses, the dicoptic video games are another paradigm of treating binocular vision uh, problems, whether there is a studio anomaly or an amblyopia. The VTS4 is another one, the Oculus VR games, and similarly Binox is another uh, program which can help improve amblyopia or binocular vision. When we have a child having a squint, we should also look for the fixation preference. Now, if you see here, the child is having a face turned to the right in the left-hand picture. If you look carefully, he's actually using his right eye. The moment I cover the right eye, he switches to the left eye. What is there is that he has an adduction preference. Now, these children who have adduction preference could be because of a, uh, either a limitation of movement altogether, or it may be a null which is there in adduction, like a Shansha syndrome or the infantile esotropia with nystagmus in abduction. So these children would have to be treated differently. If you have a Shansha syndrome, we always prefer to add a posterior fixation on the MR with recession, which will not only correct the esotropia, uh, but also correct the head posture. So when we have children, we look at the central steady and maintained fixation of each eye, which is an indirect way of assessing the visual functions. Uh, look at the follow eye movements, the horizontal and the vertical, which will also tell us about the eye movements. Now we go into a little more depth of understanding the strabismus, and there can be uh, the problem of missing A and V patterns. Now, if you look carefully, the eye in the, uh, the two eyes in the central picture are, is ortho, straight, but the moment she looks up, there is an exo. The moment she looks up, there is an eso. So here there is a pure V pattern. Uh, it's a exo which is widening on up and eso in the down gaze, ortho in the primary position. So this is uh, what the quiz masters usually like to ask a question. What kind of squint is this? So this is a strabismus sarso adductorius, but in simple terms, it is a pure V pattern. And the reason is that if you look on the tertiary positions, you find the inferior obliques are overacting. So in either side, the adducting eye is showing you a hypertropia which is indicative of an inferior oblique overaction, or nowadays we call it over elevation in adduction. And if you notice this, that here we have corrected for the inferior obliques, recess the inferior obliques. So the V pattern has got corrected. The ESO in down gaze, the EXO in up gaze, as well as the inferior oblique overactions have all been corrected. And just by tackling the inferior obliques, 
so no horizontal muscle surgery was required since the eye in the primary position was already ortho here there is a v exotropia in primary position the eyes are in uh, divergent position but they become much more exo in up gaze and less exo in down gaze so here we call it as a v exotropia with inferior oblique overaction uh, why inferior oblique overaction because the tertiary positions are showing you an over elevation in adduction as indicated by the uh, up arrows uh, in uh, on both the sides so here there is a v pattern exotropia with bilateral inferior oblique overaction contrast this with this picture here again there is a v exotropia the three pictures in the uh, central are showing you an exo which is increasing in up gaze and lessening in the down gaze but here if you see the tertiary positions there is no over elevation in adduction so this is a v exotropia without inferior oblique overaction so never jump to the conclusion that whenever there is a v there would be an inferior oblique overaction majority of the times it is true that there is v a v pattern there should you should look for an inferior oblique overaction but 15% cases may not have a inferior oblique overaction and still they have a significant v pattern they have to be handled differently and now with the help of imaging we know it is because of a vertical dystopia of the pulleys of the lateral rectus pulleys which are giving rise to this v pattern a v isotropia in this child is having an asymmetric inferior oblique overaction which is more on the left side compared to the right side uh, the uh, on the bottom you see the schematic uh, diagram which is showing you how you can actually grade the inferior oblique overaction from 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus and 4 plus a 1 plus is a 15 degrees angle that the elevating eye is making uh, a 4 plus is almost 90 degrees and in between you have a 30 degrees and 60 degrees so you can grade it by this method or you can grade it by measuring the hypertropia in adduction here there is an a pattern exotropia why is it an a pattern as you will see the central pictures are showing you exotropia in primary position becoming less in up gaze reverse of what you saw earlier and exo becoming more in down gaze so this is like a alphabet a so this is an a pattern and if you see the tertiary positions there is a hypotropia or down shoot of the eye in adduction what we may say is there is a over depression in adduction and this is because of a superior oblique overaction which is the cause of a a pattern exotropia in this case uh, but you may have an a pattern without superior oblique overactions and that again may be because of a, a dystopic pulleys of the lateral rectus causing an a pattern so when we have uh, these information what do we plan and execute this will help us in managing the a and v patterns so if there is a significant v or a pattern we call it significant if the v is more than 15 prism diopters between the down and up positions and a is more than 10 prisms difference between the up and down positions so then we call it a significant a or v pattern so first is look for the significance of a and v pattern second is if you have a significant v pattern and you look for a inferior oblique overaction you would have to weaken it similarly if there is an a pattern and there is a superior oblique overaction you have to weaken the obliques along with the horizontal surgery the horizontal surgery would be de uh, de de decided on the basis of the measurement in the primary position so if there is an ortho in primary position as we saw in the first case we only went ahead with the inferior oblique surgery and no horizontal muscle surgery on the other hand if the pattern is significant but the obliques are not significant we could manage the a or v patterns by a vertical shifting of the horizontal recti muscles or a differential recession and resection or a slanting reinsertions so this is what has been uh, talked about earlier also in the uh, lectures that for the uh, a pattern you are going to shift the medial rectus upwards for a v pattern the medial rectus is shifted downward basically towards the apex and uh, the lateral rectus is towards the base of the a or v pattern this is just a schematic showing you the uh, recess reject done along with the shifting of the horizontal rectus so when we do surgery we are going to do weakening procedures and uh the most commonly done is the recession the conventional technique is putting the sutures where we want them to be 
uh, after deciding how much recession is to be done. Another approach would be a hang back recession. So here we are passing the sutures in the sclera uh, from a distance from where it is supposed to be. So it's a hang back. It's used in the adjustable technique. Uh, in this uh, C picture, you see a retroequatorial myopexy or also called Faden or posterior fixation. Uh, then we have a weakening procedure in the form of margin and myotomy in which two thirds of the width of the uh, muscle is uh, cut, genotomized or myotomized in order to uh, relax the muscle or make it more lax. Uh, and the length tension curve is changed. So this becomes a weakening procedure. If already a surgery has been done, so this may be a, another approach by enhancing the effect of the weakened vectors. Adjustable recessions come handy if there is a problem and we'll talk about it later. Strengthening procedures are in the form of resection. So basically what you do in resection is you are going to excise the tendinous part of the uh, muscle and uh, that stretches the muscle more. It uh, improves the length tension curve of the muscle, make, makes it a more stronger muscle. It's just like a, a student who is taught T-A-U-G-H-T, uh, similar to a muscle being made taut, T-A-U-T, they both become stronger. Uh, whereas a lax student and a lax muscle are both being weak. So resection is one approach. The other approach is application. That means we double breast or double fold the muscle. We don't reject or excise any part. We are just double folding it and uh, making it more tight uh, on the length tension curve. In a, already a recessed muscle, bringing it forward is another approach which we can do called the advancement, forward advancement of the muscle to make it more tighter. And of course, transposition of the muscles can be used in uh, cases of paralytic strabismus. How much surgery would you do? You will depend on some nomograms or tables, but these have to be then changed as per your surgical technique. Uh, so there is always little change in different surgical techniques and we have to remember that. Since the eyeball, we know there are uh, sizes which may vary. In a child, in an infant, the, uh, it may be just about 17 or 18 millimeters axial length, axial diameter of the uh, eye. Whereas in a fully grown up, it may be 24 millimeters. So a shift of almost like six millimeters, it changes the circumference of the sphere. And so the millimeter rule will not work the same way. Uh, remember it is one millimeter of muscle over a, a the degree of the circumference. So we have to remember the deviations will be having a different effect if the size of the eyeball is different. So safe limits have to be kept in mind. In an infant, it may be uh, just a 5 or 5.5 millimeter maximum to be done. Uh, similarly, uh, lateral lectus 6.5 millimeters. The same is true for a hypermetrope. We have to reduce our amounts of surgery. Otherwise, we'll have an overcorrection. Similarly, for a myope, you have to increase the amounts of surgery. Otherwise, we'll have undercorrection. The functional equator decides the safe limits. So the medial rectus has a lesser safe limit because the functional equator is two millimeter forwards from the anatomical equator. And on the lateral side, it's two millimeter behind the anatomical equator. So remember this diagram in your mind when you are dealing with the procedures. Now we will have a small video uh, thing. Usually when we operate under the microscope, we sit on the temporal side or the opposite side of the muscle that we want to operate. Here the lateral lectus is being operated. A fornix incision is being shown. Uh, eight millimeters from the limbus, a small nick has been made in the conjunctiva and then in the tenons. And now with a uh, blunt hook, it is the muscle is brought into the exposed area of the fornix incision. And then a small nick is made in the intramuscular septum. And look at the pole test. So we have to ensure that the full width of the muscle is there before we start dissecting it more. So this is a pole test. See the end of the muscle is visible. And then we can move on to the other side and also the check ligaments are being cut here under the direct view. So dissecting the check ligaments and up to at least 10 millimeters, we should do a dissection. Six zero vicryl sutures are passed full thickness in the muscle, a central bite and then two interlocking bites at the two ends are passed by this suture. And then the muscle is disinserted, leaving a 0.5 millimeter stump. Uh, Slight cautery is done because the muscle ends may bleed here. 
and then when you're holding this notice that by holding you are going to shift that insertion so never use the same point for measurement landmark should be measured from the virgin part of the muscle insertion so if you're holding in the center use the poles for measurement and mark it perpendicularly otherwise you will have an error because of a shifted insertion the 60 vehicle sutures patulated needles are passed partial thickness in the sclera uh, you have to be extra careful in myopes so here both the sides you have passed the at least 5 mm of bite are taken and the 60 vehicle sutures is then tied and they finally once you are sure that the fdt is done and it's free you can close the conjunctiva with 80 vehicle sutures in re surgery sometimes you may choose to do a limbal approach rather than a fornix incision here i am showing you a plication procedure which is the uh, strengthening procedure and here again you see we are going to operate through the fornix incision bite taken in the conjunctiva and the tenons the medial rectus being hooked first with the jemisens and then the greens hook and then the pole test is done the full width of the muscle is in our hook the intramuscular septum are cut check ligaments are cut and now we measure it mark it and pass our sutures at the mark point so here interlocking bites are taken two separate sutures are taken for strengthening muscles so the two interlocking bites are taken and after this we will take a reinforce plication technique we are talking about here so what you notice here is first the bite is taken in the muscle then in the sclera just in front of the insertion this bite and then back into the muscle the muscle sclera muscle bite this is a reinforced plication like a figure of eight so once this is done then we put a, a repositor in between double fold the muscle mind you no disinsertion has been done and you just tighten the sutures the muscle gets folded back neatly and you tighten your sutures and once you have seen that the fdt is not over tight you can take out the sutures and close it with the 80 vitreal sutures remember here there is no insertion so there is no risk of slippage and also there is no risk of anti segment ischemia usually but if some sutures are sometimes uh, affecting the circulation it even the plication is known to cause anti segment ischemia especially for the inferior rectus and the best part is it can be easily undone in the first week when we do conventional surgeries we get a success rate of about 70 to 80% cases or maybe at best 90% uh, this can be improved further by an adjustable surgical technique uh, cases which are having uh, tight muscles which are more unpredictable or uh, cases which have uh, the paralytic strabismus so these are the indications for adjustable surgery when you have a more demanding patient when you want the deviations to be fully correct we have a central fusion disruption or a central scotoma eccentric fixations resurgeries vertical strabismus so in short whenever in doubt adjust so these are uh, paralytic strabismus restrictive strabismus if there is a diplopia which is a very demanding patient you need to do an adjustable surgery so what is different in adjustable surgery is that so oh, i think this video is not coming here what happened okay so just schematically what we see here is that how we adjust a bow tie knot uh, so in this adjustable techniques usually there are two kinds of uh, knots which are placed uh, we'll talk about this here now use adjustable procedure you can have a hemi hangback or a full hangback with a bow tie or as the c is showing you a sliding noose technique for adjustment when do you adjust intraoperatively you can adjust uh, at different stages we have learned from dr reniki doing a single stage adjustment strabismus surgery double s a double s under topical anesthesia or iv anesthesia or conscious anesthesia using midazolam and fentanyl with the marking made on the ceiling of the uh, out operation theater and you can adjust with the patient under topical anesthesia <clears throat> or more commonly we do a peribulbar block and we can adjust after 5 to 6 hours here important uh, thing to remember is avoid a bupivacaine which is a more longer lasting effect so you can just use xylocaine for these cases 
or you have to adjust after 24 hours, you can do it. Uh, even a sequential general anesthesia is used by some people who have the luxury of anesthesia. They can have uh, the child uh, seen out of anesthesia and then put back again uh, under, under anesthesia to adjust. So these are different techniques and you can have delayed adjustment using viscoelastic or a mitomycin C to prevent the adhesions uh, for uh, adjusting it more than two or three days. Now, this is a case, 32 year old male with vision being six by 12 and 636. He had a road traffic accident five or six years back and he happens to have a bitemporal hemianopia. So mind you, this is a very interesting situation. Since he has a bitemporal hemianopia, he is not complaining of diplopia because it is falling in the blind area. But he has an isotropia, which is going to be corrected. So in such a situation, if you do not have an exact correction, he will start complaining of diplopia if you have an overcorrection. You need just a right ortho correction so that both the uh, isotropia is corrected and diplopia doesn't occur. So in such a situation, abducens palsy with bitemporal hemianopia, I did the adjustable surgery and so that at the time of adjustment, you can get back the uh, diplopia free position to have the isotropia correct. When we talk about paralytic strabismus, like this girl comes with a face turn, there is a isotropia that is in the primary position. The abduction limitation is seen in the left eye. The eye does not actually roll back behind the midline. In such a situation, you have to do as per the algorithm, which we have talked about in the paralytic strabismus uh, section. And here, what we do in such cases is uh, doing the vertical rectus transposition. To enhance the effect, you may use Scott's posterior fixation suture. So what is shown here is inferior and superior rectus, you are passing non-absorbable sutures, 5-0 ethy bond, uh, closer to the lateral rectus so that we can vectorize the or augment the force of these vertical recti towards the paralytic muscle. This is what was done in this girl. And you can see here that the uh, deviation is corrected, the abduction is also improved, and the head posture is corrected. But when we do the such procedures, you may sometimes have an overcorrection. So we look forward to an adjustable procedure, like in this case, this is an adjustable cross-section partial VRT. So here, mind you, partial VRT, we are uh, sparing half of the uh, blood supply of the vertical recti. We are using only the temporal halves of the superior and the inferior rectus, and we are making them cross-action so that we can enhance the effect and putting them on adjustable sutures. So this is a cross-action adjustable partial VRT, which can be done to give uh, a correction and still saving the child from antisegment ischemia. So this is what has been done, an adjustable partial VRT in a lateral rectus palsy. Uh, another technique which has now come is the modified Nishida's procedure in which without disinsertion in, of the vertical recti, you can vectorize the effect by using non-absorbable sutures as the profile picture shows you, closer to the lateral rectus, eight millimeters away from the lateral rectus insertion, the sutures are passed. Now, here, this is a good procedure, but this is not adjustable. So you can add the medial rectus as an adjustable recession in order to get a more control on the deviations. So there is a dinner plate, which is having several options. You can have a partial tendon VRT, a full tendon VRT, vertical rectus transposition. You can have single muscles, SRT or IRT. You can have augmentation of these by using the resection, partly uh, 2.53 millimeters of the vertical rectus to enhance the effect. Or you can augment by foster sutures, as we talked about. You can also augment by cross-section. You can enhance the effect by having the contralateral muscle, uh, the opposite muscle, the medial rectus recession in case of lateral rectus palsy, or have a Botox injected into the medial rectus. Or you can also plicate the lateral rectus. Mind you, we are not doing a resection, but plication in order to save the anti-segment ischemia risk. Coming to the superior oblique palsies, as we talked about in some of the uh, talks earlier, we have learned that it's a hypertropia in one eye, which increases in adduction. So here in the second step, you see hypertropia in the right eye is increasing as shown by the arrow. And when we do the right-sided head tilt test, the Bilshawski's head tilt test, you see the upshoot 
of the right eye on right sided head tilt this confirms it is a true right superior oblique palsy so this is a three step test right hypertrophia in primary position increasing of the hypertrophia in adduction and third step is on the head tilt there is a upshoot of the eye on the same side that means it's a superior oblique palsy if you look into the fundus there will be an extorsion if there is a bilateral superior oblique palsy this is one pearl which you have to remember that there may be a history of head trauma which usually is there subjective complaints of torsion that means the objective torsion may be more than 10 degrees alternating hypertrophia on uh, having the head tilted to either side so there is a right up shoot on right head tilt and left up shoot on left head tilt so there is a bilateral superior oblique palsy and you'll also notice a v pattern esotropia and usually such a person will not have a head turned to one side head tilted to right or left but usually a chin down position like a charging bull in the china shop when we are dealing with obliques uh, we usually are now saying don't do myectomy it is better to have a tamed wolf as a dog rather than a rabid dog who becomes wolfine so don't shoot them tame them if you want always use a simple and effective procedure that can be reversed so use a razor which has an eraser on the other end so the inferior oblique weakening procedures to put in perspective are several we have the inferior oblique shown you uh, in this schematic diagram and if you go along the course of the inferior oblique it's a sphinx or a pax recession or a modified iliate nankin in which you are entero positioning so here this is the along the path of the inferior oblique that we are doing this is a pure recession you can have a graded recession 6 8 10 12 14 mm of recession but if you are entero positioning this is as described by iliate and nankin this will also have an anti elevation effect why because the neurovascular bundle acts as the functional origin and the distal part of the inferior oblique when it contracts on looking up actually it prevents the eye to roll up so it's an anti elevator so this may be a good technique for dvds dissociated vertical deviations but otherwise it may be a problem so you need to do a modified iliate and nankin procedure or a stagers anteronasal transposition which is also very good for a 4 plus inferior oblique overaction mind you no myectomies and no denervation or extirpation of the inferior oblique uh, is what we practice divergence excess now sometimes the deviations may be different for distance and near fixation so if you see like in this child the near the deviation is less but for distance fixation is much more so many a times the intermittent divergence twins you have to do look for a far distance maybe much more than 20 meters or look him uh, ask him to look outside and see for the full deviation or he may have a divergence excess exo which should be seen so you can have more details in the exotropia section but when we have true divergence excess one of the approaches could be using a combo recess reject on the same lateral rectus also known as the scott procedure for the convergence excess esotropia we usually add a fardan on the medial rectus so this is a pre op and the post op that we talked about when the problem is complex we usually have a different approach even the bird knows how to drink water in such a situation we should be doing better myopic strabismus fixus was a age old problem since for the last 20 years prior to the 20 years when we were doing lot of recessions of medial rectus and still being unsuccessful what we were not realizing was the problem was different when imaging was done and as shown by yoko yama uh, in the procedure he showed that the it is basically the shift of the path of the lateral rectus which is the problem so this is because of a high myope and there is a intramuscular septum superior temporal area which is thin or weak and causes a sliding nasally of the superior rectus and the lateral rectus shifts down so here as you see in the schematic diagram the angle between the superior rectus and the lateral rectus is not 90 degrees but much more obtuse so this causes the superior rectus to act like an adductor much more as an adductor even in the primary position and the lateral rectus is not able to act fully as an abductor because it is slided down in the inferior compartment 
If you tighten the lateral rectus in such a situation, it will not be effective. It will only make it more depressive. So that is the reason such surgeries fail. What is required is uh, reshifting the path of the lateral rectus. So as you see in these images, the inferior rectus here in down much below and superior rectus is the nasal path. So what we do is do a superior rectus, loop, lateral rectus loop myopexy to correct the deviations of the person. So these are dramatically correcting with much less effect on uh, recession of the medial rectus even. Sometimes no medial rectus recession is required to be done. Only the loop myopexy will help correct the cases like this. Another problem which can sometimes require a little different approach is aberrant regeneration. Now what you see is a third nerve palsy in the primary position in the center. And when he is asked to look in the left gaze, you see that the eye is not adducting so much. There is still a residual uh, adduction deficiency. But the interesting part is that the ptosis gets corrected. So ptosis is much more in abduction compared to adduction. What is happening is there is a misinnervation. The in LPS is getting the innervation which was supposed to be coming to medial rectus. So on adduction or sometimes the inferior rectus innervation comes to the LPS. So on looking down, there is an improvement in the lid position. Now here, if we choose to operate on the other eye, the left eye, as has been done in this case, you can get the correction of ptosis without the oculoplasty surgeon's help and it will correct the deviation of the person as well as the ptosis. Duane's has been talked about in some of the uh, lecture again. You can go into more details. But here, remember, these are very dramatically uh, down or up shooting eyes with uh, sunken eyeballs, which can be improved upon by a proper planning, as has been talked about in Duane's retraction syndrome management. So what we are talking about today is a targeted strabismus surgery. We need to identify the misinnervation and transpose the misdirected muscle to the correct side like in this case, uh, the inferior rectus was the uh, misinnervating. It was causing a down shoot, which we described as the SID syndrome, the synergistic innervational down shoot. And so what I did was shift the inferior rectus to the medial rectus position. And as you see from the upper picture and the bottom picture, the deviation has got corrected. The down shoot also has got corrected. And this could be confirmed by imaging uh, MRI, which is done in different gazes. And this is what we had done and described in uh, Canadian Journal. So to summarize the talk, we need to be a squintellectual. We need to see this case. Each one has a different variation. And that is the beauty as well as the challenge of dealing with strabismus cases. But if you find out what is the basic problem and correct it, you can restore the alignment, uh, of course, in the primary position. and many times even in all the nine gazes as well as improve the lid position by your strabismus surgery. So the mission as I usually like to end with is spreading sight and happiness for kids the world across for maintaining the stereopsis and restoring the loss and this is the mission that you all are going to join me and spread it forward all over the planet to restore the binocular vision and stereopsis of all the children. Thank you for uh, uh, this listening and carrying out this mission. Thank you all. I thank from my heart, my family, my residents, my patients who have been in, uh, in so much uh, helping me in getting to this position of pursuing this journey of strabismus to stereopsis. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you so much for wrapping up the Strabismus sessions with those pearls of Strabismus and uh, aptly called the last word from the master himself. Uh, I'll just address a few questions, sir, that we have from our social uh, media portals. Um, yeah, please. So one of the question is, is there an instrument preference while performing the cover uncover test that is opaque versus transparent occluder? Okay, so if you have a Spielmann occluder, you can see through the at the time of cover also what is happening behind the cover. So a Spielmann occluder is a translucent occluder. So if you happen to have it, it definitely helps. But more often, you may have an op opaque occluder. Uh, you may use the opaque occluder with a little bit of tilt of 30 degrees so that you can peep on the side. 
if you do not have a spielman occluded so that also works but you have to be smarter than the child because he may also peak <laughs> that's true uh, second is a basis of performing uh, the pbct in all nine gazes so uh, ideally one should uh, do the pbct in all the nine gazes it may not always be possible uh, but in concomitant strabismus you do it in the primary position center and then you see in the different positions if with the same prism if there if there is any change happening so if it's concomitant deviation you may just easily do it in all the nine gazes by asking the person to look through the prism in different positions now if with the same loose prism which you are holding in the uh, central gaze you ask him to look up and you find that the divergence is uh, becoming worse then you can add on the prisms and do it in up and down gazes which is definitely required for measuring the a and b patterns now for the paralytic strabismus you may have to do in all the nine gazes especially if you are documenting the change uh, fr from each visit so then you can check for all the nine gazes a little more elaborate way of doing it but you can use the same prism bar in different gazes either you can turn the head of the person with the eyes being in the same or you may ask the person to look in different gazes the measurements are not much different either way so the next one is what are the challenges on performing strabismus surgery under topical anesthesia if you have this is a real challenge because uh, of course i mean this is only going to be possible in cooperative adults in children general anesthesia is the only way and usually up to 14 years we are mostly doing under general anesthesia so uh, cooperative adults we may uh, do it under topical anesthesia but uh, since the muscles are very sensitive area and they may cause a, a vagal uh, inner uh, i mean the vasovagal attack so you have to be very careful bradycardia may be there uh, even uh, as was talked about in one of the talks earlier during adjustment a child a person adult fainted because of the muscle being done under topical anesthesia so you have to be careful you may require a standby anesthetist if you are doing it under topical anesthesia so we had done a study using the midazolam and fentanyl to provide the iv sedation and just using paracaine for topical anesthesia uh, in adults so this is possible but you need to have uh, some way of uh, reducing the anxiety of the person and having some pain relief with the help of either midazolam fentanyl uh, purely a topical just paracaine may be little more demanding unless it's a very small procedure then you can do it and so the last one is can you please explain the quantification of the recession or the resection to be performed based on the amount of deviation measured preoperatively yeah so this is something which we usually uh, do it either by the nomograms which are there in the books so you can follow any nomogram to start with and then see your own results so depending upon your surgical technique which may be variable for example how much muscle stump you are leaving behind how much passage how much looseness of sutures you leave behind so these are little variations which may require to modify the surgical nomogram which are there in the books a uh, millimeter rule is not correct to be followed because uh, the muscle usually do not uh, have a straight linear uh, uh, correction uh, for different deviations the amount of um, correction which we get for the first uh, few millimeters is much less so for example a uh, 2 mm may not have any effect at all of recession or resection more than 2.5 mm will have some effect 2.5 to 3.5 is not the same as 5.5 to 6 so the at the upper ends you have much more effect so it's a s shaped curve that's why we do not go by a simple uh, mm rule uh, as a linear path so you may have like different zones you, in your mind that okay up to this much 20 prisms i'll do this much 20 to 30 i'll do this much or you can have a table in front of you and you can use it so measure it properly with the help of prism bar and then use these tables and do a proper uh, measured uh, surgery as we talked about that use it with perpendicular from the insertion because these variations are the things which you can probably uh, in order uh, to correct to some extent still there will be some variation and you will have to bear with uh, this fact that you are a simple mortal being and <laughs> you are not god none of us are so we have to be careful about this and never over assume that you will get a 100% correction in all cases you may be lucky to be in 90% cases getting that but the rest will give you a surprise on the other day okay so with that sir we wrap up the questions for the evening 
And sir, I must uh, say and tell this to all the viewers, we all know that who is the master of uh, strabismus for all of us. And this lecture has one of the best viewerships of all the sessions and the audience is stuck around till the end at uh, like, you know, throughout the lecture. So thanks a lot, sir, for your presence, which is, really means a lot to us. You have been there for every single session. Rolika, I would like to thank you people for giving me this opportunity to reach out to so, uh, such a large audience. And it, this is what we together are uh, really supposed to be doing, spreading the message uh, to the last corner so that our future generations of children can be helped. They can be assured of stereopsis. The pursuit of stereopsis is the goal of all of us ophthalmologists. So I think let's carry on with this voyage. Thank you all. Thank you, Rolika. Thank you, uh, Shifali. Thank you, Subhav. And once again, thank you, Sunil ji, for giving this uh, broadcast. And thank you, Santosh, who must be busy in the oculoplasty today. So yes. thanks for this platform. Thank you all. Thank you so, thank much, you so sir. much, sir. And all the audience, thank you. Precious time. And uh, the next lecture will be a quiz by Dr. Rajesh Prabhu, sir, which will be a very interesting quiz based on all the lectures that you all have viewed over the past 41 sessions. And uh, Shifali has something to tell you about the physical eye focus. So as we have been mentioning, the uh, physical eye focus is back and it will be held in New Delhi from February 26 to March 5th. So do not delay. Registration is open and we are uh, catering to 300 delegates. So register as soon as possible. I'm sure it will be like really helpful for uh, wrapping up your postgraduate uh, academics. So see you all in New Delhi. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir, for Thank being you. with us. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you, sir. Enjoy your dinner. Bye,